Today's episode is called Eli's Sons, The Cost of Disobedience. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of the high priest Eli. We had a whole episode on them, but today we're going to kind of talk about Eli and God's response to their wickedness and what role Eli played in that. Hey, it's Amber, wife, mother, type A child of God. Here are little things we look at everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for listening. So it's a bit of a longer reading, but I think it's really important, so bear with me. And if you have a Bible, go ahead and follow along. I'm in 1 Samuel chapter 2, beginning at verse 22. Now Eli, who was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So we didn't hear about that before. We had heard about the offerings and the things that they were doing there. But now we're finding out they were sleeping with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting and that All of Israel were talking about this. They knew about it. So reading on verse 23. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people, again, not just one or two, all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, it is not good report that I hear spreading among the Lord's people. If a man sins against another man, God may mediate for him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with the men. Now, I'm just going to say a couple of brief things before we keep moving on. And that is that it, saying it's the Lord's will to put them to death, it's much like Pharaoh in the book of Genesis, who every time that Moses brought another plague through the Lord, uh, Pharaoh would repent. I have sinned. Pray to your God for me. Make this stop. And then I'll let the people go. And then as soon as the plague went away, Pharaoh was like, oh, never mind. No, I'm not going to do that. And the idea being that Pharaoh, his repentance wasn't sincere. And eventually, after he hardened his heart so many times, God just said, enough. This isn't, I'm not, your heart is hard. Now the judgment has been done. The same is true here. Eli's sons were not interested in their father's rebuke at all. They had completely dishonored God. We're going to hear more about that in just a little bit. And um, God was done. Their hearts had become hard. They were not caring what the people of Israel were saying. They didn't care about what their father said. And so then when their hearts were hard, they did not respond in repentance. God allowed their hearts to be hard and he, he the judgment was passed. Uh, just a little note about, and the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. It's um, the same phrase that Luke uses to talk about Jesus when he was at the temple, when he was 12 years old, that Jesus also grew in stature and favor with the Lord and with men. All right, reading on, starting at verse 27. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, this is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your father's house when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your father out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, and to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your father's house all the offerings made with fire by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me? by fattening yourselves on the choice part of every offering made by the people of Israel. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that your house and your father's house would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me. 
Those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your father's house so there will not be an old man in your family line and you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, in your family line there will never be an old man. Every one of you that I did not cut off from my altar will be spared only to blind your eyes with tears and to grieve your heart and all your descendants will die in the prime of life. This happens, by the way, Later on in the book of 1 Samuel, um, King Saul puts to death all the priests of Nob who are in Eli's family line. Verse 34, And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his house. And he will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a crust of bread and plead, appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. So God clearly was not okay with the disobedience of Eli's sons and the dishonor that they brought to God's chosen priestly line by all the sin and wickedness that they were doing. Okay, so any of us, first of all, who works in God's kingdom, so I'm not talking just podcasters. I'm talking if you're a teacher of any sort, even a Sunday school teacher, if you teach a women's Bible study, if you you know teach catechism or Bible history classes, or if you're in some capacity working in the church, teaching people, or even working in your home, having people come to your house for Bible studies, whatever, we need to be taking this seriously. So how seriously? Well, James says in James 3.1, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. God takes this seriously. If you're a called worker, if you're a pastor or a teacher, or even I've never been a quote unquote called teacher in terms of, you know, having a call to teach in some capacity. But like I said, if you're in any of those roles that I just listed, if you are representing God and teaching God's word to other people, you should be taking God's commandments very seriously. Luke 12, verse 48 says, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. It is a huge responsibility to teach people the word of God. We don't want to lead people astray. We don't want to uh, somehow teach what's not in the word. And sometimes we do that with our own lifestyle. So I can be telling you all day long, listen to God's commands, do what he says, you know, take these things seriously. And then as soon as I turn off this camera, if I'm out living in such a way that you, if you were to see me on the street, you would go, wait a second, that she's not living the way she's teaching, then I have totally dishonored God. I have broken actually the second commandment, which is all about keeping God's name holy and, you know, representing God well to the people that I'm teaching and also to the community at large. So this is something we need to take seriously. Now you might be saying right now, well, I guess I'm off the hook because I don't teach Sunday school or women's Bible studies and I'm not a called worker. So I'm all good. Not so fast. Go and read Colossians chapter 1, where Paul is praying that the Colossians would live a life worthy of the name of Christ, that they would bear fruit and grow in the knowledge of God. Look, all of us who call ourselves Christians, what that name means, Christians, is actually Christ bearer. We bear the name of Christ. When we go to work, when we go out in our communities, We represent God. We're his ambassadors on earth. Just today, I was taking my daughter to work. And twice, 
In fact, I was thinking, okay, God, are you testing my patience? What's going on? Because twice there was somebody driving in front of me that wasn't being super thoughtful. They weren't necessarily, you know, obeying traffic laws or doing what they should be. And I just stayed super calm and cool. I was just like, okay, God, I am representing you. It's okay. Anywhere we go, whether we're in the grocery store, at a school function, like I said, or at work, we're representing Christ. So this is for all of us. Now, right now you might say, okay, Amber, well, I mean, does God expect perfection? No, God doesn't expect perfection. He knows we're sinful. He knows that we're going to sin and we're going to fall. That's not what he's asking of us. He's asking us to take his command seriously, not just to give into it. Look, Hophni and Phineas were not trying to behave. They were blatantly disrespecting God. They could care less what God was saying. They were going to live life their own way on their own terms. So we're not talking about a sin that you're struggling with or when someone, you know, confronts you um, that you aren't saying, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that. I've got to do better. Sometimes it takes a long time to get out of the habits that we've gotten into. Whether it's gossiping or overeating or drinking too much or spending too much, being greedy, being lazy, being selfish. Um, so many things. That's why we need the word. And that's why we need other Christians convicting us. One of the things that I've been doing is trying to make a point to get back into reading the voice of the martyrs. Because uh, when I was working all the time, it was really hard for me to keep up with everything. So, you know, of course, things got pushed aside. But when I go back to the voice of the martyrs and I read what our Christian brothers and sisters around the world are going through, and I think about how they need food and clothes and just, you know, basic necessities, and many of them have lost everything. They've lost their job. They've lost their family sometimes, their house, whatever. It's so easy for me to see how wicked my materialism is, how I am so greedy and self-indulgent. And I need that to knock it out of me. Like, you know what? You don't need this. Why did God give you what he gave you? He gave you this amber to steward, to steward well. So one of my major goals this year is to give more to be more generous to others, to forget I have more than enough, forget my wants, and to look more to what other people need. So anyway, the point being, if you're struggling with sin, you're struggling with sin. It's, it's not, you know, you're not removed. You're not uh, disqualified from teaching or, or uh, being fruitful in God's kingdom if you're struggling through. There are certain sins that you might be for a time, you know, if you're caught in a sexual sin, if you're having an affair, that type of thing, you, you, you may have disqualified yourself. But by and large, if you're struggling through, God isn't demanding perfection. He's just wanting you to acknowledge the commands and take them seriously. Okay, I'm going to give you three reasons why we should care about obedience. Reason number one, disobedience is going to exclude us from the blessings of God. I tell my kids this all the time. I mean, they could be right behind me saying this out loud because they've heard it so many times. There is no blessing in disobedience. If you think you're going to get there faster, if you think somehow you're going to pull one over on God and you're going to get uh, something better because you do it the wrong way, you're you're wrong. There, the blessings the 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 blessings come when we follow God's ways. He has put His commands and His rules there for our blessing and for our protection. So, the longer you live in disobedience, the further you're separating yourself from God. God is righteous; He doesn't sin. So, if God is righteous and you absolutely decide you're going to go your own way, look. He's not moving and he's not going to follow you. You're just moving away from God. And eventually you're going to realize that was the wrong way and turn around. The only question is, 
how many scars are you going to have and how far and how long are, are you going to have to go to get back? Um, the prodigal son. The father didn't go with the son into the pig pen. He was watching and he was waiting when the son returned. But God doesn't follow us into our sin, patting us on the back and going, way to go. No, he's there when we return. But we're just, we're just taking the long route if we think that we're going anywhere and gaining anything by disobedience. My grandpa always used to say, why walk in the mud, Amber, if you could walk on the sidewalk? That seems like a good analogy to me. Okay, number two. You actually don't get the things that you want through disobedience. All of us want these things. We have these ideas of what we want in life. You know, maybe you want to get married at such and such an age and you want kids and you want a house and you want the yard and you want the cat and the dog and the chickens or whatever. Or maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want the career. Maybe you want the prestige. Maybe you want authority. Maybe you want people answering to you. I don't know what you want. But disobedience actually isn't going to get you much except for earthly pleasure. So at the end of the day, so many people, when they get to whatever they think, wherever they want to go, so when they get the job of their dreams, when they're married, they have the kids, they have the family, they have the house, they sort of start looking around and going, I thought that this would fill me up more than it does. So many people, when they get the achievement that they have been working for, whatever it is, the job, whatever, they find such emptiness because it's all worldly stuff. And the worldly stuff promises a lot, but it delivers very little. The stuff that you actually want and that you actually are seeking, what your heart is longing for, is the joy and the peace and the love that you're not going to get pursuing all the things of the world. So again, you can pursue all you want, but at the end of it, you're going to find yourself happy. At the end of your life, what is it you really want? I saw so many people sitting in a nursing home, and again, I've said this before, but it, it just made such a profound impact on me. They're all sitting in the same size room, okay? So, I mean, I suppose you could, if you had lots and lots and lots of money, you could pay to have, you know, some incredible big mansion with people taking care of you. That's not these people. Most of us are, if we live long enough, and if we aren't able to take care of ourselves, it's all going to come down to a few outfits of clothes, a couple pictures, and a little room with a bed in it. Now, what do you want when you're there? Do you want the relationships? Do you want a family that comes and visits you and loves to see you, even though you're not the person you weren't once were? Do you want the joy of the Lord in your heart? Knowing that even if you don't have your right mind, people can still be joyful. They can absolutely not understand a whole lot, but they can still be happy. Do you want the peace of knowing that you're going to your heavenly father? That peace that, you know, even on your deathbed, you're not confused or wondering or being with a Christian who dies is just so different because they, they know where they're going. Is that what you're after? That's not going to happen through disobedience. So disobedience, as much as it promises us, it's not going to get us where we want to go. And number three, the big rewards that you're pushing for cannot be bought. And I'm actually talking about the rewards now that God gives. So Jesus said that if you give a little child a cup of water in his name, your heavenly father will see it and you will surely not lose your reward. Now look, it, it's crazy for us to think about because we are so steeped in this world and thinking that 
we want this, 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 and this. I want it to look good, right? God rewards us in ways that the world just can't. And if we let him be the giver of rewards without worrying about pursuing certain things, we will be absolutely astonished at where we end up. So here's the thing. This is what I'm talking about. So wives, if you're married and you and your husband have a disagreement, he wants to go one way, you want to go another way. You, you just, you can't come to terms with this. But you're a Christian wife, so you say, hey, you know what? God has asked me to submit. So I'm going to go ahead and, and let you do what you think is best. We've talked about it. We've prayed about it. I, I'm not totally at peace, but I'm going to be at peace because I'm going to let you handle this because God has asked me to do that. And then you walk away totally at peace. You say, God, work it out. I'm going to obey you because this is what you've asked of me. And if he's wrong, you work it out. But I'm just going to obey you. You can absolutely be assured there will be blessing at the other end of that. There will be a reward. Now, I don't know what it's going to be, but there will be something. With my children, I just told one of my children, she had a very different idea of what she should do than what Steve and I thought she should do. And the bottom line is, when it comes down to it, if you, as a child even though you absolutely disagree, even if you think your parents are the worst people on earth, if you say, God, I'm going to obey my parents because you have put them over me. I don't agree with this. I think I'm missing an opportunity that would be far better for me. But I'm going to trust you that even if my parents don't allow me to have this opportunity, you will give me something better. Or you will work it out for my good in some way. I'm just going to watch and wait. I don't know what the reward will be. And I don't know if you'll see it in two weeks or a month or two years. But I know there will be one. Because God blesses obedience. If you honor your parents, your aging parents, if you, even when it's hard, even when things are not going well, if you say to God, look, I'm just going to, you know, respond in love and I'm going to do my best and I'm just going to do it their way, even though I don't think (laughs) their way is the most efficient or whatever, because my mom asked me to park here or shop here or do this. I'm going to do it because I love her and I'm honoring her and I respect her. And I hope that that brings glory to you, Lord. Look, there might not be the reward that day in terms of you might be parking at a place you don't want to park. You might be shopping at a place that's more expensive or totally out of your way or or what have you. But God sees the heart. And maybe the reward will be in that relationship being so much better than it otherwise would be if you were just bucking the system all the time and saying, no, we're not doing that. And this is what we're going to do. And what I don't, I don't know what the reward is. All I know is that when God rewards us, it is far better than anything we could pursue on earth. And I know that when we choose the path of obedience, there's always blessing and reward in that. Even if it means, at the time, pain. I remember my grandma saying to me, and I was newly married, newly married, years and years ago. My, my grandma died in 2001. And I, I she came down and we were talking one day and she was sitting at my house. And I was saying something about, Grandma, it's so hard for me to give offerings to the church right now because this is what they're going to spend them on. And she looked at me and she said, Amber, you know, you give your offerings to the Lord and you don't worry about it because the Lord will deal with the people who are spending the offerings. If they're spending them in a, in a wrong way, he'll deal with that, but you don't have to worry about it. All you have to do is give your offerings to the world, to the Lord, and he'll look at your heart and he'll respond and it will be okay. 
She said, I never worry about where my offerings go. Life lesson that has guided me and helped me my entire life. It has been a stable of my life that, you know what, the church council will figure out how to spend this money. And sometimes they spend money in ways that I think, well, I mean, I wouldn't have done that. But guess what? Sometimes I spend my husband's money <laughs> in ways that he probably thinks, do we really need that, Amber? So we need to have grace with other people too. Bottom line is, work for the Lord. Obey for the Lord. Submit to the Lord and let him deal with all the rest. He sees your heart. He sees your motives. It is entirely a different thing when we are disobedient, disrespectful, when we refuse to submit. God sees that too. And that is not the path of blessing. Lots to think about today, but it's an important topic. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things.